Welcome to Community Close-Ups, a webinar series highlighting the unique and talented individuals in our community. David, how are you? I am doing good. We are starting to get into the deep end of winter and uh, everybody's excited about it getting warmer. Uh, lots of uh, announcements for events have been made for SharePoint Conference and ECS, so it's becoming a busy time. We've got Summit right around the corner, uh, North American Collaboration Summit right around the corner, so lots of exciting times uh, right around the corner. <laughs> but we have as a guest today, Sharon Weaver from Smarter Consulting, uh, the owner, singular owner of Smarter Consulting. Sharon, thank you for joining us today and being our guest. Thanks for having me. Why don't you start out by telling everybody in the community a little bit about yourself, your family, where you're from, and all that jazz? So let's see. I was born in Kansas City, and when I was six months old, we moved. Um, my parents moved so my dad could finish college, so we lived in South Carolina for the first four years of my life. And I had two additional siblings while we lived there. And then we came back to Kansas City for a few years, and I had a couple more siblings. And my dad went into the army when I was nine, and we moved to Fort Polk, Louisiana, where I had a couple more siblings. <laughs> and by the time it's all done, I'm the oldest of seven. And when I was 13, we moved back to Kansas City, um, and I stayed, and my parents kind of kept on scooting around. My dad stayed in the military my whole life, so he was in for 30 years, um, and he just retired recently. And I have two siblings that near live nearby, and I have two siblings that live near my parents, and I have uh, four children. So we have two boys and two girls that are, um, they range from 28 to 20. We have one granddaughter that's six. And um, then I have, uh, my sister died a few years ago. And so her kids now live with me as well. So I have my two nephews. Um, and so we thought we were done with kids. And now I have a 14 year old nephew that I'm raising. Hey, what you do for family, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I I stay busy. Which child's your favorite? I oh I don't have favorites. Oh dang. I was hoping for, for some some drama. I bet you could win some trivia questions though around the whole grandma thing. Like I didn't ever picture you as a grandma. Nope. <laughs> Everybody asks that, but now yeah, she's six this year, so you still like living in Kansas? Um I you know, I like Midwestern values. I like the cost of living. I like the people. Um, there's a lot of things I really do like about Kansas. Um, low crime. It's gorgeous here. Just, you know, the the, the nature is beautiful. Um, I would say the only thing I really don't like is the winters get really, really cold and we have ice and sleet. It's not just like pretty snow. It's icky. Um, and then in the summers, it gets incredibly hot. And so we go from, you know, 10 or 15 degrees in the winter to 110 degrees in the summer. So it's a lot of variability. Um, and in the meantime, if it's not super, super cold, it's probably rainy. So I like it for some of the values, but I wouldn't say that I love the weather. I like Kansas for the food. Yes. I like the, I like the barbecue food. Okie Joe's is my go-to. We, we have all the food. So in Kansas City, you can get pretty much any kind of food on the entire planet, and it's amazing. Do you say Oklahoma Joe's? Yeah, Oklahoma Joe's, Genghis Khan, Mongolian Grill is my go, my two go-tos when I, when I visit. Yep. Speaking of weather, I think probably everybody in the world always thinks of Kansas and the whole Wizard of Oz scenes and stuff like that, right? Tornadoes. How real is that for you guys? Like, I know you get warnings and stuff, but is that really uh, as scary as sometimes Hollywood portrays it to be? Um. So I have been. I actually have been in one tornado in my entire life. Um, we take it seriously. You know, a big enough tornado can rip a house out of the ground. Um, mm -hmm. So we do take it seriously. In the spring and the fall, we have um, alarms. And if, a, if there's a tornado warning, you probably want to be in your basement because it can rip your house out of the ground. So it's kind of a scary thing. However, that said, um, most of the warnings don't turn into much of anything. It turns into some nasty wind, and rain, and things like that. I have been through one tornado. We stayed in the basement, and it did actually rip the shingles off our roof when I was a kid. But that's about as bad as it got. So I'm not going to say we're too scared of it. In fact, if you talk to people here, a lot of times they're sitting out back, like, taking pictures. <laughs> so I don't think they take it too seriously. So what I hear is you're officially a tornado survivor. 
right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a tornado survivor. <laughs> So you, uh, you, you lived in Kansas, South Carolina, back to Kansas. You've actually done a fair amount of traveling, though, from what we've seen. And, and I was interested in this because uh, we had asked you what the most interesting place you'd ever visited was. And you said Paris, France. But yep. then your favorite place to visit was the Bahamas. Like yep. two totally different things. So I think Bo would have a little bit of input on the Bahamas. But I'd love to know, like, you say France was the most interesting, but the Bahamas is your favorite. So how do those have such separation. So when you go to other places and you see the cultural differences, I consider that interesting. So the food and um, historical monuments, you know, especially when you think about things like Europe versus the United States, then, you know, we, we have, we don't have things that are as old as they do. So it's always fascinating to me to go and to see buildings that are far older than our country is. Yeah. Um, the, it, the people are different. The smell in the air is different. Like everything's just really neat, right? Um, because there's just all these fascinating things that we don't have here. So I think it's it's really fun to go to other places. And by no means do I say that you know when I go places, I want I want to go to all the places. <laughs> like I want to I want to see all of them. Um, Nassau is my favorite because it's my favorite spot to be. So there, when you're in Nassau. Um, the sun, like the, the sunset is different. The color of the sky is different. You can smell the ocean. The sand is soft and warm and white. And, and it's just, it makes me happy to be there. And so I, and I probably go to Nassau twice a year at least. Um, and so it's just a place that I kind of go when I want to chill and enjoy the sunshine and being somewhere different. Yeah, and, and you do lots of cruises too, right? That's when you go go down there? I do. So I do fly to Nassau occasionally and just stay down there. Um, but yes, um, so I, I wrote it down. When I, I think I'm on number 27 coming up. Um, yeah. I think I'm on my 20. I think I'm, I've done 26 cruises. I think I'm doing number 27 in May. Yeah, wow. I would say we're Facebook friends and then I always see, oh, here's a three day trip to forever <laughs> or like, oh, that's awesome. My favorite place that I've been to is the Bahamas, uh, but it is Exuma. Um, I just there's no hustle and bustle that Nassau has, um, so it's very yes. quiet, quiet. But the water is still just as amazing, and it's a little expensive there. But I will go back ten times before I go back to Na Nassau, just because it feels so isolated away, and like you don't deal with the traffic or anything like that, or crime, or yes, yeah. The Bahamas is like. It's like a pretty place for Americans to go and enjoy life. Yeah, and it's not far. I mean, it's like 100 miles off the coast, so it's not like yeah. it's a big, big trip for most people from Florida. Or... Yeah. No, in fact, a lot of people that live in Miami and Port Canaveral, they'll take their boats and just run down there for the weekend. They'll, you know, they'll kind of yacht down there, or scoot down there, and park in one of the marinas and hang out in the Bahamas for the weekend and then take their boat back. So it's, yeah, it's not far at all. It's a really kind of, safe short enjoyable boat ride down there yeah i've seen lots of people do like jet skis from miami to bimini which is like 50 miles yeah. off the coast oh so did you go to paris in france i went to paris in 2005 hmm. um, so jonathan's sister my sister-in-law was studying abroad who senior year in college and so over spring break her mom and I actually flew over there and stayed with her for a week during spring break. What was the coolest thing that you remember seeing or eating or all that and the reason I ask is because they had just announced ECS and so ECS is in Weisbad in Germany but so I'm going over taking a whole vacation out of it bringing the family and we're going to go to France and um, Brussels and obviously Germany and some of that area so I was just kind of curious what what you were saying about things being older than our country is so true. I was looking on Airbnb and they had houses that were like, oh, this little cottage is older than the U.S. Constitution. And I'm like, wow, that's, you know, right. crazy. So I think my favorite thing over there that we did is um, a lot of people. Well, there's two. I have two favorites. I have lots of favorites, but everything's my favorite. Um, <laughs> I, the two best things we did is one, so everybody wants to go see um, Versailles when you're in France or especially in your Paris, um, but we actually didn't get to go to Versailles because they were doing some repairs on it when we went. And so we went to Fontainebleau instead. 
and Fontainebleau was just amazing. Um, it's kind of like um, a little country cottage compared to Versailles, but it's still gorgeous. Um, and so it was really, really neat to get to go to see Fontainebleau. Um, and then the other thing that we did is, I don't know if you know this, a lot of people don't realize this, and it was really cool since my sister-in-law was living there that she got to kind of tell some of the historical stuff. Um, but there's a lot of Roman stuff inside of Paris proper because they built, um, I mean, Paris has been rebuilt several times, um, but they built it on some Roman stuff and there's several Colosseums. And so we actually got to go down this back alley um, and go see this little Roman Colosseum that still stands. And to get to go see the actual Colosseum and the stones and um, the, the containers and stuff that, that all still exist there, um, which was, you know, predates even um, like two versions of Paris was really neat. Wow, that is cool. Yeah, it's pretty amazing the amount of history that's over there, especially for someone like me from Los Angeles where things are rebuilt weekly, it feels like, via either fires or earthquakes or just needing to build a new building. So Sharon, since we touched on food, you know, being from Kansas City, big barbecue, uh, there, there's lots else available there though. So what is some of your favorite outside of what is considered typical Kansas City food that you like to go in your, go, you know, enjoy in your area? So it all depends on, you know, kind of what you want to deal with in the calorie section. So <laughs> we have good solid Midwestern stock, right? So we have some of the best steak in the country. Um, and I, I grew up, you know, eating meat and potatoes here and fish and rice in Louisiana. So I'll eat pretty much anything. Um, so I think my favorite probably is definitely, um, fish and rice of some sort. Um, and what's really nice is we have a lot of that here. So you can go get, um, any sort of catfish or whitefish or whatever and rice type of size you want. Um, and then another one that a lot of people don't realize we have a lot of really good options for is um, Asian food. So we have a lot of really good Thai food and we have um, a lot of really good sushi. So I, I tend to stick to those even though we're a steak and potatoes town, um, just because I think it's a little bit healthier and it's lower on the cows. But if you like um, meat and potatoes, we got plenty of those. <laughs> I, I will say like Kansas, you're just enveloped with meat like as you drive through the highway from like the airport, it's just meat packing industry the whole way. And so you, you really think about Kansas bar barbecue being like the main course, but I've had some really good Thai food or like I said, Mongolian food is my favorite there. So completely yeah. agree. And, and like almost every, I think every guest we've had on so far, food is a big part of your culture, but coffee tends to lead in the uh, drinking category, right? So you had mentioned that your favorite drink of everything was a vanilla latte and your favorite way to start the morning <laughs> is uh, coffee. So yeah, connoisseur. Yeah. So, I mean, I think just like anybody in this industry, I work long days and I go nonstop. And so I, I joke that I live on coffee and water. Um, but yeah, I, we have some really great coffee here. We have a place called the roastery where we've got local, um, coffee that they make. Um, and their coffee is some of the best in the country, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then on top of that, we have a ton of just local breweries and local coffee. We've got beer and coffee, um, all over Kansas city. And we've got all these little like coffee, um, joints, like little barista places, um, that are just local. Um, we do have Starbucks, but we have a lot of local ones too. Um, and so, yeah, if I can get a coffee anywhere, um, until about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, you've probably seen me one with them in my hand from the time I get up until, <laughs> till about dinner time. <laughs> and you're starting to see, you had mentioned like a brewery and coffee, right? Do you have any that are like combined? Cause I've started to see a lot of distilleries doing special roasting of coffee beans. In fact, I had gotten one out by Bo at a, at a distillery near him when we were out visiting him. Um, do you, have you used or had any of that big fan or not a fan or? Um, I've seen several that do, I'm not a big fan of the cold brew coffee. Um, but I have seen several that have it. Um, and as far as I know, everybody loves it. Uh, so here's an interesting tidbit. Um, so Kansas has been a dry state um, up until maybe a year ago or so, which means what that means is that you have to go to um, a state liquor store 
um, or a state approved liquor store to buy liquor. So it's really weird for us because on the Kansas side, you can go to the grocery store, but you can't buy really buy alcohol there. Um, you might be able to buy like a 3-2 wine cooler, but, <laughs> but that's it, right? And then you go across the state line to Missouri and you can buy whiskey at the grocery store. And so it's weird in Kansas because we haven't combined our alcohol with our other beverages for a long time. Um, and not too long ago, they started lifting the laws. So up until six months or a year ago, you couldn't even buy alcohol on Sundays in Kansas, like at all, anywhere. You couldn't even go anywhere and get it. Um, and now um, they're starting to open that up. And so I think that's really encouraging some of those places to start having some of the more poppy um, alcohol hybrids just because it's existing where it didn't exist before. Well, and, and, and kind of what I was referring to is just the, the beans being roasted in um, casks from like bourbon. I know Starbucks has started doing that or rum casks. They'll roast oh, the beans yeah. inside of the, the barrels. And it, it it's not alcoholic when you actually brew the coffee, but it's got the very strong flavor of that, which I, I actually I'm not I don't drink at all. But I, I actually really enjoy those because you get the richness of the alcohol, but you don't get the, the bitter bite of the alcohol, which is what I don't like about alcohol. So. I haven't tried that yet, but it sounds fantastic. So between me and you guys, you know, and this going out on the internet, um, I'm a whiskey girl. And so I will drink, whiskey is my favorite alcohol out of everything. And so I, that sounds fantastic. To eat yes. rum or mm -hmm. and coffee, that, that sounds like a good blend to me. <laughs> a winning combination. Mm -hmm. So you, you also said that your favorite ice cream is uh, Rocky Road. Now, mm -hmm. do you like the original recipe of Rocky Road, which is super hard to find, or the the mainstay Rock, Rocky Road, which has almonds in it? I, I believe the original recipe used to have walnuts in it. Yeah, so I'm a super fine connoisseur of Rocky Road ice creams, and I've actually dabbled and tried it in like almost every single manufacturer because I like it so well. So the the number one Rocky Road ice cream is Hagen Dosh, um, because they do. Um, the way that their nuts are cut is a little different. And then they actually do ribbons of like this marshmallow cream mm -hmm. instead of actual marshmallows. Um, and of course it's hog and dash ice cream. So, you know, who can knock it? Um, but I, I prefer the walnuts. So when I find Rocky Road that has walnuts, I'm really excited. Um, but, and then, you know, like there's like the store brand Rocky Road and I usually don't trust that very much. <laughs> I've always so I used to work at a ice cream shop where we made our our own ice cream when I, back when I was like 16. Lucky. And yeah, it was awesome. I had to I got to make my own ice cream, which was cool. Um, but I found for for people who liked ice cream that had lots of stuff in it, there's two types of people, and it's either Rocky Road or Moose Tracks. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I'm a Moose Tracks guy because because I don't love chocolate ice cream. Ah, okay. Uh, or like chocolate, I like chocolate, but chocolate ice cream just doesn't really sit well with me for some re reason. It feels like chalky. If it's not done well, it's really chalky. Um, I'm a moose tracks guy myself. But. Yeah, so I kind of have one rule in life and that I try really hard to eat ice cream every day. Um, <laughs> That's actually, I had a friend one time that told me if you ever have a cold, just eat a pint of ice cream and take a good sleep and you'll be fine in the morning. Um, but every night before I go to bed, I tend to eat some sort of ice cream. Right now, um, my kick is mochi. Um, mm -hmm. So if you haven't had mochi, I'm going to help you gain another thousand pounds um, because it's ice cream wrapped in dough and then frozen. Mm. Wow. So it makes my ice cream habit even easier. <laughs> So you would like this one, and if you ever travel to Vermont, you can get this. But at the ice cream shop that I worked at, uh, we had a ice cream that was uh, maple bur bourbon uh, oh. vanilla ice cream. So it was Maker's Mark bur bourbon in vanilla ice cream, and it's so good. So if you ever go to Vermont for a vacation or something, look for Island Homemade Ice, ice Cream, and it is mm -hmm. spot on. Well, and so speaking of that hybrid kind of thing, I was just going to say, if you're a big haagen fan, I don't know if you've seen, they have a new spirits line, they call it. I did. Uh, yeah. And they've got bourbon and uh -huh. uh, they've got bourbon and stout and rum and a bunch of different flavors. It's actually not bad. Yeah, um, it's definitely on my list. I kind of, I've been kind of holding off. I kind of want to wait for it to get warm outside. I feel like that's a perfect thing to sit out on the back porch and eat at, you know, like when the weather's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. 
you're drinking the coffee on the porch in the uh, summer, you're eating the ice cream on the porch it's all about yeah. the porch i see uh, i yeah my my swing is well used so i'm on swing number two or three now since we've lived in this house i wear them out sit on swing in the evenings and sit back there with my laptop and work well we just learned from our last uh visitor on the show um about swedish fika okay and uh it's it's this idea that before you start your day um you spend some time just kind of reflecting on what you're going to do during the day or what you're going you know like how your day is going to be so you jonathan can go out on the swing every day for 15 minutes before work and just kind of drink your co coffees and talk about what, what you're going to accomplish and uh, apparently it's a great start to your day so yeah when, when the weather's nice that's actually what i do every single day is i get up i grab my coffee i go sit outside for 10 or 15 minutes just kind of breathe and think about what's going on for the day and chill and then when it's cold outside i do the same thing but i do it at my desk so the opposite so, of the day you said you like to watch tv or go out to dinner or read right so is there yep. any favorite books or authors um i so i kind of i i'm always reading at least like three or four different books at a time i have a kindle which has been fantastic because i can like have all my books on it and i kind of read them all at the same time um i think the series i'm reading now so i always have like a fiction and a nonfiction, and the fiction series that i'm reading now is called the gender wars um and it it's um it's really interesting it's a dystopian uh series basically about um something happened and then everybody kind of repopulated and the they became a matriarchal society on one side of the river and a patriarchal society on the other side of the river um and it's it's a really kind of an interesting dynamic of you know kind of how both things kind of interact with each other um, so that's my fictional series that I've been reading for probably the last year or so. Um, there's a whole bunch of books on it. And then for nonfiction, and I just love reading pretty much anything, um, everything from self-help to Warren Buffett to whatever's interesting at the time. SharePoint blogs. SharePoint blogs. Yeah, I joke. I actually tell people, like most people sit down and watch TV shows and I watch uh, Microsoft videos. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So like I, there are some bloggers out there who write such good blogs that they're actually enjoyable to read, like Joanne Klein or Laura, Laura makes some really right, really great blogs and like they just, yeah. they're, they're so smooth and like just easy going. So like some, sometimes I'll just pull up Joanne's blog and just read through like, I don't know, 20 minutes of whatever. And it's just easy, easy. Yeah, they're they're both good. I like Hugo because Hugo gets um, very detailed in his blogs, uh, even even when it's not necessarily tech. Like I appreciate that in tech for sure, uh, but yeah. even when describing just anything, he had done recently one on the accessibility Xbox controller and kind of went into some history there. And so it's it's I like it when you feel like you're getting your money's worth, so to speak, in terms of time investment of reading. <laughs> right. So to, I'd say from the SharePoint community, two blogs that I really enjoy. Um, Heather Newman's blog is always really good. Um, I always like that. I think one of the things I like about it is that she's so diverse. Like she'll talk about this and then she'll talk about something else and then she'll talk about something else. But it all kind of comes back to the same types of things. Um, and Joel Olson has a really fantastic blog. And if you guys don't know, he has a travel blog, too, um, yeah. which <laughs> so I'm constantly looking at where he's going and where he's where he's been and what he's seen and things like that. We should give a shout shout out to Joel as well. His his blog is uh, travelingepic.com. Um, the guy has been to so so many countries. So if you love to see different cultures, different pictures, definitely check out his blog. So we always talk about cars, and I'm super excited for yours. <laughs> so everyone says like they want a Tesla, or no offense to anyone else who has been on the show, but you are the first person who has picked a car that is like up there, right? I mean, you picked a $300,000 car. Uh, you did pick a convertible though. So you you did pick the uh, Aston Martin, Martin DB11 uh, Volante, yep. which is a very nice car. So have you, what's your, what's your re reasoning behind that? 
So, I mean, so my husband and my kids are car people. Um, both of my boys are car people. And so we have been looking at cars and going to car shows as long as my kids have been alive. Um, and we have so many cars around here. That, so now that's one thing maybe people don't realize about Kansas City. Um, we are car crazy. And so people, one of the activities that goes on in Kansas City that has gone on since I was in high school is the minute you get your license, you start driving cars up and down the strip and you show off your cars. That's what we do. Um, and on the weekends, it's really on the weekends, you know, if the sunshine comes out and it's a nice day, people will actually like get their nicer cars out of the garage and they just drive them around for the fun of it. Um, so we have a lot of really nice cars in Kansas City. So it's it's interesting to me because what I think is a nice car isn't always what a lot of people think is a nice car. So there's a lot of people in Kansas City that drive things like Teslas and Corvettes and um, Camaros and, you know, things that I think a lot of people would think are nicer cars. Um, and so we kind of have to stretch a little. And we have several really nice, we have a dealership called uh, Aristocrat Motors here. Um, and they sell a variety of high-end cars, um, Mercedes and um, Porsche and things like that. So one of the few cars that is very difficult to get in Kansas City are things like the Aston Martin. So when you're driving around and you're going to all these car shows and you're seeing all these different things, um, we started looking at what are the cars we really like and I got used to them. And I think there's this idea of you habituate things, right? So you get used to them. You've seen them, other people driving them. You've seen them at the car lot. And so you want something that's different. And so I started actually researching and saying, okay, what are the cars we don't have? What are the cars that I think would be really neat to see? And um, the Aston Martin is a line that we just don't see very often here. So I started looking into them and they, I just, I like the way they look. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're really nice and, and um, they've got clean lines and they're well done and they're technology forward. And so, and they're, they're out of my price range. Uh, <laughs> and, so it, and, and so then, um, you know, so I started watching that and not too long ago, um, the BMW came out with the, what is it? The i8, um, 8i, i8, something like that. Um, and I saw one of them drive by me going to work one day. And I was like, wait, I think I found my next new car. And so I'm taking pictures of it and sending it to my husband. And he's like, well, of course you like it. That's a $160,000 car. Yeah, so the that car is very uh, interesting because, so they only produced, or they only, or, they are, they only ordered like 1,500 of them or somewhere around there. Right. Uh, but the CEO, he individually inspected them so oh, before wow. they went out to customers he actually inspected every single car that went out which is pretty great you don't really see that with any other company so that's insane I think that they have a very low run number of them and that was why they were kind of unique and special but i didn't realize that he did that that's cool yeah it's really cool so sharon in addition to all the interests in your personal life that we've talked about obviously you've got a big interest in microsoft 365 community sharepoint so how did you get started? There's always a story for how everyone got started in SharePoint. What's what's yours? So I um, have always been a computer nerd. I've always worked on different things. I have a background in data and web development and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and I actually was doing a contract um, for um, a company here, and I was a BA. I was doing a business uh, business anal business uh, business analyst contract, and the thing was is that i was going back and forth doing uat with the business and the people that i was actually working with were like three or four floors above me on in the building and so what we would do is i would actually print the spreadsheet out i would take it up to them we would do uat we would go over the requirements um and they would sign off on it um and then i would go back downstairs to my desk and i would enter it all in the system and we would talk about it and then they would email me when they were ready for another test and so they would email me or call me and say okay we're ready for another test i would print the spreadsheet off i would update all the stuff i would take it upstairs we would sit down we do uat we did this on and on and on right and it was kind of just not efficient at all well, around that time, TFS, they were rolling TFS out um, with the development group, and they said, we got this thing called SharePoint with it. It stores files or something. If you guys want to figure out what it does, um, take a look at it and see if it'll do anything that'll help you. Well, everybody in my team's like, well, it's just folders, so who cares? So I started, I'm, I'm a click all the buttons kind of girl. Um, and <laughs> If you give me software, I'm going to click every button there is because I want to know what it does. I'm going to click it all, then I'm going to right click it all, then I'm going to find out what all the options are. And all so, the I, right? Yes. 
So <laughs> I'm clicking, 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 and I put my documents in there. And when I right clicked on the folder, I found this little button that said you could send alerts. And I'm like, wait a minute. I can send myself an alert when they upload this document because what was happening is they would upload the document and then they would either email me or call me to tell me that it was there. But a lot of times what would happen is I wouldn't know about it until two or three hours after they had done it because they'd forget or they'd go to lunch or whatever. And by then I'd already lost all that time. So I turned on alerts and all of a sudden I knew as soon as they put the document in, as soon as they made changes to the document, I was getting alerts. And all of a sudden I could just be right on top of it. Um, and I was like, this is kind of cool. And so I started digging more and more into SharePoint over the next year or two. Um, and I ended up um, going to another contract where they had Jira and they had SharePoint and they had another couple things. And they're like, can you help kind of do some administrative stuff since you have a background in applications? I'm like, sure, no problem. So I took over some of the admin stuff for Jira and SharePoint because of course nobody else wanted to do it anyways. And um, I started digging into it and clicking more buttons and learning what it could do. And I built us like this little portal where I could post information and then we could pull Confluence in and we could have a little wiki in there. And all of a sudden it's like, this is really neat, all the stuff I can do with it. So I went to, when I went to uh, re-up my contract to go to the next place, um, the recruiter said to me, he's like, so what, do you, you know, what kind of jobs are you looking for? And I said, I think I really want to stick with the SharePoint thing. And he was like, nah you should like do crystal reports or something because that sharepoint thing's never going to amount to anything crystal crystal reports yeah that, that's yeah, doing yeah. well i joke like i should send him a christmas card every year and tell him how much i appreciated his advice um i as you can see i stayed in sharepoint and um i worked my way up and kind of the rest is history <laughs> everybody tried to get me to not do sharepoint because everybody told me sharepoint was dumb and not worth it yeah, and coming from, so I we're, we come from a development background, and when I first got into SharePoint, uh, when I graduated col college, everyone was like, no, don't do it, don't do it, and these were all .NET developers, they are right. like, don't do it, it's awful, terrible, don't, just stay away from it, and after spending time with it, you realize why they felt that way, <laughs> you're like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that was really difficult, this was hard, that doesn't make sense, um, so that's, so, like, it's so always had the stigma of like don't get in, into it but once you get into it you like fall in love with the platform you fall in yeah. love with the community and so it's so hard to just want like to get out because you love everything about being inside 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 of it yeah in fact i tell people um sharepoint reminds me of tinker toys the, so now i'm showing my age um and tinker toys are like one of my favorite toys as a kid because you can make anything with them and SharePoint's kind of the same way as like, you can make anything you want, but you can deliver something quickly and easily. And so it is, you kind of get addicted to the fact that there's this kind of easy platform to make whatever you want. So you speak a lot, what, besides comms first, what other types of events are you doing this year? Um, let's see, my next one, I'm speaking at SP TechCon. So I'm doing a half day workshop for Office 365 and Teams collaboration. Um, and then I'm doing a right, just a one hour session on Office 365. Um, and then in March, I'm keynoting at SharePoint Saturday Omaha, uh, March 21st. And then um, April, I think it's the first weekend in April, um, I'm going to be SharePoint Saturday Houston. Hmm. And then the end of April is Commsverse. And I think so that's about, yeah, that's about what I've got kind of planned out. I, I think that's everybody <laughs> um, for the next couple of months. So how did you get started speaking? Because obviously you started out using the software, right? Um, you're a consumer. How did you bridge that gap between, hey, I, I have stuff I want to share now, and here is why I'm comfortable sharing it in this community? So if you haven't figured it out, nobody's ever accused me of being shy or quiet. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was um, about two or three years old, my dad handed me a microphone for the first time. So my dad um, is a professional singer also. Um, and so I grew up in front of people. So when I was three or four years old, my dad handed me a mic and said, all right, you're gonna learn how to sing in front of people. And so I grew up um, performing in front of people basically my whole life. I was on stage from the time I was five, um, performing in front of people. In fact, when I switched to speaking as opposed to singing, um, my husband made a lot of fun of me because the way I hold my microphone is actually for actor singers and I have to change it when I speak. And so for the longest time I held my mic up 
<laughs> and I had to learn how to actually hold it down in front of me. It was actually quite a, that was probably the biggest struggle for me when I started speaking was holding the microphone in the right way. So I grew up in front of people. So being in front of people has never been a big deal. Um, but when I really started becoming a specialist in applications, um, everybody asked me for my advice and uh, people started asking me to do like lunch and learns and things like that at, at my job. And so I started doing webinars and lunch and learns within the companies I was working with. Um, and not too long after that, the local college actually reached out to me and said, hey, um, we hear that you know how to do this and that you're comfortable being in front of people. Would you like to come in and do a practice teach and maybe just be an adjunct and teach some SharePoint classes on the side? And I'm like, sure, why not? Um, and so I started teaching for the local college which made me just more comfortable well they have this um, annual office conference that they do and so they asked me if i'd like to participate in that and so i did that um and about the same time i did that um i was uh i went to i don't know if it was the very first one but one of the very first sharepoint saturday st louis um and they needed speakers and so i was like sure why not i'll come and talk about something and so i spoke at the office conference and i spoke at sharepoint saturday st louis that year um and after that i i just kind of got addicted to it i I, I love being in front of people. I love sharing information. I love talking about things. It was really funny, actually, the first night that I taught my class um, at the local college, I came home and my husband said, so what do you think? I said, they pay me to talk. <laughs> it's amazing. So I got from behind the computer. And, it was, and what's funny is I've lived my whole life kind of being on stage and being in front of people, but I love working on computers and I love building applications. And I love doing things on the computer. And so the transition of being in front of people wasn't hard, but the transition to talking about what I know was actually more difficult than the being in front of people because I got really nervous about, well, what if I, what if what I say is wrong or what if people um, don't get what they need out of it or what if I'm confusing them and things like that. So it took me probably a good solid couple of years to really understand how to take what I knew and translate that into something that provided value to the audience, um, which was a completely different thing. And so, and I still do, I mean, I still, when I'm making my decks, I try really hard to keep it basic and um, make sure that it makes sense. And I don't try to not cover too much ground at once and things like that. It's all these kind of tips and tricks around being a speaker. I feel like that's how, every, how many people start. And I also feel that's how many people feel. We all have this some level of imposter syndrome when we are doing things so do we want are we presenting something is it the correct thing and so many times it's difficult because there's five ways to do one one thing yeah. which way is the best way so sometimes you preface it with like this is how i do it in my implementations but your experience may vary vary based on all these scenarios right um but i think so many people um, who want to get into speaking uh, Lunch and learns are the best way to, to do it and to get comfortable with speaking in front of a small group of people. Um, but before you start going out to user groups or going to apply to conferences or SharePoint Saturday events, one of the questions we always ask is, what is the best icebreaker if someone was to come up and see you at an event? So you're speaking at, at a SPS event or you're speaking at Commsverse, kind of what is the best icebreaker to kind of get down and chat with you? Um, travel, anything travel related. I will talk for hours and hours and hours and hours about anything travel related, um, especially if it's cruises or islands or something sunny and Caribbean related. Um, but I mean, frankly, I'll talk to anybody about anything. Like I said, you know, I'm not quiet or shy, so I'll talk to pretty much anybody about anything. Um, but if they start with travel, it's definitely a good icebreaker. Um, if it's technical, um, you know, things like uh, data, statistics, things like that. I'm, I'm definitely a math nerd. And if you start talking about statistics and predictive analytics and things like that, that's definitely a good conversation too. <laughs> so speaking of travel, because we kind of talked about this earlier, but we should do it officially. Uh, you have a small announcement about uh, some traveling that might be happening around Ignite. Yeah, so um, once we get done with Ignite, everybody wants to kind of go kick back and relax and, you know, chill with their friends after a long week of doing that. And so we have actually booked a Microsoft Community Cruise. 
that leaves Saturday. Um, I think it leaves at like four o'clock. You have to be on, be there right around noon or something like that. But Saturday we're taking off. Um, it cruises out of New Orleans and it goes to the Bahamas and then it turns around and comes back. So for seven days, you can be with all of your best Microsoft friends and you can bring your family, you can bring other friends, you can bring your spouses, um, but it's just gonna be a week afterwards for everybody just to hang out, have a good time. So if people are interested in going, uh, how did they get information about it? Where should they go? I'm actually going to be posting that information on my website, which is www.sharoneweaver.com. And I will, I've got a travel, um, a little travel button up there that has nothing right now. Um, but here in about the next 24 hours, it's going to have all of the details of exactly what you need to do. Awesome. Cool. We'll include a link to that in the blog post for this episode as well. Thanks, Sharon, for uh, joining us today. We appreciate it. It's always good to connect with the community and let the other community members know a little bit more about who we are because uh, we're more than just tech and blogs and samples and demos. So thanks for joining us. Yep. Thanks for having me.